Hi YouTubers, this is Lonnie Clark again, that's for art. Um, I'm going to read more of our book, Population Control Through Nuclear Pollution. We're almost finished, I think we've got less than 10 pages. We're on chapter 11, page 221. The title of the chapter is Moral and Social Responsibility of Science and Scientists. The new subtitle that we're on is called AEC is 18 years late with biomedical program. No, the Atomic Energy Commission would not admit its failures to win the public confidence. And this, of course, is why the request was made of Lawrence Radiation Laboratory to set up a biomedical program, long range in scope, to evaluate the impact on man and the biosphere of radioactivity release from its various atomic programs. On the face of it, this request was obviously ridiculous. Who, we asked ourselves then, would believe in the sincerity of the AEC's concern for public health when 18 years after its operation, plus expenditure of over a half a billion dollars on health effects of radiation, it is finally deciding to evaluate the impact of radioactivity upon release upon man. The public could probably the public could properly be expected to ask. What had the AEC and its already existing 19 laboratories of biomedical research been doing for 18 years that had failed to learn the impact of radioactivity release? Well, the public would hardly have been alone. For all of us who were being asked to undertake this task at Lawrence Laboratory, we're asking each other the very same question. Why believe any of this? A new leaf being turned over. Let's forget the errors of the past. The Lawrence Laboratory is a strong independent laboratory. It stands for truth. We want only the truth. We at Lawrence will back you no matter how much the AEC tries to suppress the true facts of the hazard of the atomic energy programs to man. The issue is of supreme national importance. You must undertake this task even if you have little or no confidence in the credibility of the AEC. Why we Danieled, that's in quotes, Danieled, why we Danieled into the lion's den, we shall have an abundant opportunity to reflect upon now that our throats have been thoroughly slashed, and we can repent in leisure what we accepted to do in haste. But while we can be criticized as naive in thinking the new leaf might be any less disease-ridden than the old leaf, or that AEC wanted any part of the truth, even we do not truly realize the gruesome nature of the Salome A. C. E. Salome E. C. demands. Uh, I don't really know what that means. Salome, S. A. L. O. M. E. with an accent over it. Dash, capital E, capital C. Salome, maybe he's making a, I don't know, a joke. Nor did we think our scientific colleagues in the directorate of the Lawrence Radiation Laboratory would melt away like ice cubes in that hot summer. That we felt, that we felt would certainly not happen. Optimism dies hard. And somehow, blissfully ignorant of reality, we still had confidence in the integrity of democratic ideals. While scientific dissent from promoters' ambitions might be unpopular, nevertheless, the realization that dissent and criticism in public health matters are vital uh, excuse me. Nevertheless, the realization that dissent and criticism in public health matters are vital would guarantee a hearing of the facts, or so we had hoped erroneously. To those who think the environmental struggle for survival of life on this planet is going to be a proper tea party, we say, think again. For those who think reason will prevail, we say, that's a fond dream. To those who say repression of truth, reprisal against those who try to present the truth, and disdain for the right of the public to hear the evidence, are products of Nazi Germany or other equally despicable society, dictatorial societies, we say, look close to home. 
It is happening here. And the most shocking, uh, and in the most shocking of all areas, that of the guardianship of the health and welfare of life on earth. New subtitle, A Reward of Derision and Slander. Are you incredulous, disbelieving? Then examine the evidence yourself. Look not for evility in man, rather understand the arrogance and omnipotence fantasies of science, technology, and their scientists and technologists. And realize that this is a self-moving force inducing men to respond as pawns, unknowingly, unwillingly, and believing unto themselves they are performing a worthy task for their fellow men. Tamplin and Goffman presented evidence before a highly respected scientific body that our allowable radiation exposures for the population are grossly unsafe and could lead to a massive public health disaster. The AEC response, derision, denial, slander, but no evidence in refutation. Having asked for the study to be done, the AEC ridicules the result of the study since it, since it wasn't the hoped for result. Science? Responsibility to the public? Dr. Michael May, director of the Lawrence Laboratory, requested of Goffman that before he and Tamplin present any further evidence, the AEC be given an opportunity to see it in advance. He assured them that this was no effort in suppression. He would prevent any such suppression. But the AEC needed to know in advance so they could be prepared. This seemed altogether reasonable. Tamplin and Goffman agreed. Two short weeks later, Tamplin submitted a, sub, a manuscript on, quote, nuclear power and the public safety, unquote, to be presented several weeks later at the American Association for the Advancement of Science annual meeting. Dr. Roger Batzel, Associate Director of Lawrence Laboratory, was asked to forward the manuscript to the AEC so they could have plenty of advanced knowledge. What happened? The Batzel censored manuscript was returned to Tamplin with little left in it but the prep prepositions and conjunctions. In quote, we have this original censored manuscript in our possession and should probably donate it to the Smithsonian as a future relic of barbarianism in human endeavors, as an exemplary antithesis of free scientific inquiry, unquote. And Dr. Batzel informed Tamplin that to present the original uncensored manuscript, he would have to get his own personal typist, typewriter, paper, and travel funds to attend the scientific meeting to which he had been specifically invited because of his expertise. So here we go again. This scientist, Tamplin, was willing to knuckle down because he wanted to be paid. It's bullshit. New subtitle. Lawrence Lab knuckles down to censorship. Goffman reminded Dr. May of his promise of no suppression and indicated that Dr. Batzel's censorship of scientific truth meant the end of Lawrence Radiation Laboratory having any right to masquerade as a scientific laboratory. Dr. May replied that Goffman shouldn't feel badly about this little bit of censorship since after all he wasn't going to Goffman and Tamplin he wasn't going to do to Goffman and Tamplin what the AEC had suggested be done. Oh, how kind of them. We never asked precisely what the hydra-hated monster did want him to do with us. Finally, because Goffman threatened to expose the laboratory censorship and suppression at the open meeting of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the Lawrence Radiation Laboratory directors backed off and Tamplin was permitted to present his paper with modifications greater than he had intended. Incidentally, the meeting was held in Boston, December 28, 1969. In retrospect, it would have been far better to announce the censorship and absence of scientific freedom of Lawrence Radiation Laboratory then and there.
From that point on, the repression and reprisal mounted rapidly. Tamplin had successfully conducted his research efforts with a staff of 12 people. Eight of these staff members were summarily removed from Tamplin's group. The reason? Budget cuts. The laboratory had suffered a 10% budget cut. Tamplin suffered a 67% reduction in staff. Is that budget cuts? New subtitle. AEC finances trips only if speakers are favorable. Next, Tamplin and Goffman were asked by numerous citizen groups and communities to come to speak concerning the hazard, of, hazard aspect of radiation from atomic energy programs proposed for their respective communities. The AEC lavishly provided speakers to such community meetings to extol the virtues of its extensive of its atomic programs and to deny any radiation any hazards from radiation. All expenses paid courtesy of the American taxpayer. But who paid for Tamplin and Goffman to present the hazard aspect of the question? The citizens out of their personal meager resources paid just like today. This, according to the AEC, represents providing the American public with an open forum for consideration of all aspects of the radiation hazard question. If, as an American taxpayer, concerned about your health and that of your children and further descendants, you are incensed at this concept of an open forum, save some of your anger, for the full truth is even more devastating. The best is yet to come. When Pennsylvania citizens were concerned that a forthcoming proposal, proposed plowshare nuclear explosive project for their state might be a hazard to their health, <coughs> the Lawrence Radiation Laboratory stood ready to reassure the Pennsylvanians. Dr. Bernard Shore, the director of the Lawrence Radiation Laboratory Biomedical Division, and two other biomedical scientists were paid their salaries and all expenses to go to Pennsylvania to reassure the citizens. A panel discussion was held at Pennsylvania State University on April 7, 1968. This, of course, the Lawrence Radiation Laboratory regarded as a proper work assignment. Of course, we must add that Lawrence Laboratory, using taxpayer funds, happened to be the promoter of the plowshare technology. But when Tamplin was invited by community groups to tell them about the hazards of radiation as an offset to AEC sanitized education, was regarded by Lawrence Radiation Laboratory as part of his work on assignment? Oh no. The provision of the truth concerning radiation hazards was regarded as extracurricular and Tamplin lost his salary for each day he contributed to society. This is another faucet of the AEC in Lawrence Laboratory, a concept of providing a full picture of the radiation hazards to the American taxpayers. Tamplin's pay docked for being away a weekend. And so, stumble bumble into the Lawrence Radiation Laboratory in its efforts to prove to the AEC its desire to please them, they even docked Tamplin's pay for Friday, Saturday, and Sunday while he attended a national meeting of the 12th Science Writer Seminar in the American Cancer Society in San Antonio, Texas. But Lawrence Radiation Laboratory doesn't work on Saturdays and Sundays. When we asked the directors of Lawrence Lab how ludicrous they intended to be in their efforts to suppress the truth, we must admit they did agree to reinstate Tamplin's Saturday and Sunday pay. That particular American Cancer Society meeting is of special interest. All scientists chosen to attend were so chosen by special invitation of the Cancer Society. Any scientific laboratory in the world would, of course, be honored to have one of its staff members chosen to intend. Indeed, at any other time, we have little doubt that Tamplin would have been kissed on both cheeks by the Lawrence Radiation Laboratory Directorate and sent off to the Cancer Society meeting with a garland of roses. 
But to talk about radiation-induced cancers? Horrors! Repression is not complete until it is total. And the Lawrence Laboratory was, has wasted no time or effort trying to reach that goal. After all, Big Brother AEC was calling for blood, and one doesn't offend the master demanding human sacrifices for the unpardonable sin of telling the true facts concerning radiation hazards. So having taken two-thirds of Tamplin's research staff away for budgetary reasons, they completed the task by taking three of the, four of the remaining four associates away from him. They were extremely careful to take away his associate who did reference researches and secretarial work for him. This, they obviously reasoned, would at least put a powerful crimp in any of his efforts to do further investigation of the hazard of radiation to humans. Tamplin is not a good typist, unfortunately. And finally, Tamplin and Goffman were threatened with dismissal from Lawrence Radiation Laboratory if they persisted in what they were doing. And what crime were they committing? 1. Finding out the truth about radiation hazards. 2. Making the findings widely available. 3. Pointing out the inaccuracies, half-truths, and outright falsehoods of the AEC and its hangers-on. Such are the antisocial, anti-human actions of science technology and science technologists imbued with their arrogant, omnipotent beliefs. They are caught up in this dynamic. They probably believe they are doing what they are doing is right, even though it destroys democracy, makes a mockery of scientific freedom, and prevents saving the planet from irreversible pollution. Shall they be held shall they not be held accountable as a group as individuals and that my friends ends chapter 11 and tomorrow or when i get back to this we'll head on to the final and last chapter 12 the urgent need for scientific adversaries so well talk to you guys later put your courage feet on i think we definitely need it i think the shit's about to hit the fan sounds like all of these nuclear power plants are falling apart so we just have to have uh faith in ourselves in the universe in our ability as human beings to come together and um you know persevere perseverance brings success so ciao you guys <laughs>